foremost in Europe, the Waldensians stand as a body of believers who resisted the compromises that came into Christianity following the superficial conversion of Constantine in the fourth century. They were based primarily here amongst the stunning and beautiful mountains of northern Italy. Some say the first Waldensian was Peter Waldo, a 12th century merchant man from Lyon, France, and they're named after him. However, there are records that date back much further to at least the fourth century with Vigilantis. One of the early names for Waldensians was in Sabati, showing that early on part of their identity was Sabbath keeping. Chapter 4 outlines the key role that they played in preserving a knowledge of God's word and the principles of true Christian living in the face of great opposition. Often the Waldensians had to leave the lower valleys and flee into the mountains and even worship in secret. Caves like this dot the landscape, and they were a place of refuge and protection, a secret sanctuary, a cleft in the rock. They gave it the comfort of living peaceful lives because they believed differently than the state religion, and they valued their beliefs more than peace, prosperity, and an easy life. It would not have been easy living a much more primitive life up here but their desire to be true to the principles of God's word was greater than their love of ease. This cave is a quiet place, not grand with gold and marble, and yet here on countless occasions, the presence of God would have been witnessed and felt as he encouraged his people to be true and firm to him in their faith and worship. The Waldensians had a passion for mission service. They were not content to live happy and holy lives, isolated as hermits in the mountains, but they intentionally trained others to go out. Using schools like this one, the College of the Baths, they taught the Bible, they copied the Bible by hand, and they prepared to go out as undercover agents for God. They sent students to the leading universities in Europe, and they also traveled as merchants to the major cities in Europe. They did not take a copy of the whole Bible, but sometimes it was just a few pages hidden between the pieces of cloth on their cloak. And when they found someone who was a seeker for truth, they would take it out and share it with them. They had passion, ingenuity, and a desire to see the gospel spread beyond the boundaries of the valleys and mountains they lived in. May we have that same passion today. For centuries they had stood alone and suffered persecution, but in 1532 the significant Synod of Chanfran would take place right here, where leaders of the Waldensian churches would meet leaders of the various Protestant churches to discuss beliefs and a plan moving forward. One significant decision that was made was for the Waldensian Bible to be translated into French with the Waldensian churches raising the funds for this. Other commonalities that were discussed was a rejection of the mass, confession, the celibacy of the priesthood, the celebration of feasts and purgatory. In times of isolation and persecution, it's important to seek out community and support from other like-minded believers. The Waldensians are one of the most persecuted and yet faithful groups throughout European history. On the 24th of April, 1655, they suffered perhaps their worst slaughter as a massacre led by the Duke of Savoy started at 4 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Men, women, children and babies were mercilessly tortured and killed in the most gruesome ways imaginable. In order to escape this terrible massacre, hundreds of Waldensians fled to a large cave in the towering Mount Castelluzzo. The murderous soldiers, however, found them and marched them to the top. They came to this spot right here and were hurled over the edge to their death on the rocks below. I believe that on the resurrection morning, many faithful believers will rise to glory from the bottom of this mountain and in this valley. This is the reference in Milton's famous sonnet to the bloody Piedmontese that hurled mother and infant down the rocks. 
Survivors of the massacre were few, but they rallied together and wrote to Christians throughout Europe for help. Their letters included the heart-rending words, our tears are no longer of water, they are of blood. They do not merely obscure our sight, but choke our very heart. When Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of England, heard of the massacre, he called for a national day of fasting and collected money to send to meet the physical needs of the Waldensians. The Waldensians had a faith that reminds me of Job. They were a people who suffered attacks and persecutions for several centuries, close to a thousand years, suffering immeasurably, and yet for many it did not weaken their faith, but rather strengthen it. Sometimes in life we may be serving God, dedicating our lives to Him, and yet we still go through hard times, trials, and sufferings that many say we do not deserve. May we have a faith like Job, who said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Whatever we go through in life, may we keep hold of God, trusting that he has our best interests at heart. What an inspiring history, the faith of our fathers. May the Lord help us that uh, we'll have a firm faith. Now we'll turn our attention to praise and worship. Happy Sabbath. Yes, we'll turn to our first one will be hymn number 10. Hymn number 10. hundred and fifty four the great physician is here. Speaks the 
to our uh, hymn troid, hymn 672. 672. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we can gather in your house today. No matter what our week has been like, that we can come to you and your presence and worship you. Fellowship with our brothers and sisters and gain strength for the new week ahead. Yes. And Father, we ask in a special way for your Holy Spirit to be here, that our hearts and minds would be open to receive your word and be strengthened by our worship and by our fellowship and by the word that you have impressed upon my heart this morning. We ask that you would be with us today and, and, and be in our worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, church family. I just love the awesome response and... Um, it sounds really awesome coming from, from you guys. Okay, so um, I want to wish you each a happy Sabbath, and uh, I pray that you are blessed today with the service. Um, we have David, who's going to be our speaker, and we have Zuri, who's going to do our scripture reading, and then myself. Uh, we have Sister Tigas at the piano, and want to welcome you here. If you need anything, let us know. There are blue uh, cards in the back on the offering box. If you have any requests or anything like that, or you want Bible studies or membership transfers or anything like that, feel free and uh, fill any of those out and just put them into the offering box. We can have our opening song, if you like. Hymn 590. May we all rise. Hymn 590.
may be seated. It is our praise and our prayer time. So this is a time where we can share our praises and our testimonies and prayer requests uh, before our church family and uh, so we can help strengthen each other. The Bible says that they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's each one of us. We go through our strengths and our weaknesses, but when we share them with each other, we can make each other stronger and help grow stronger in Christ. Now he will have a microphone passing throughout, so just uh, raise your hand and... Um, he will bring you the microphone. Ezra and Lulu. Um, it was my brother's birthday, and I'm so thankful that he's turning six, and I just want to say a prayer request that um, he will go well in the sight of the Lord. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, I have a, a prayer request um, for, for health. Um, we've been going through, I guess, the last week and a half, a lot of sickness in the house. Um, I don't know if it's cold or flus or whatever it is, but uh, um, Amani had been sick for a while, and she was pretty lethargic at one point. We ended up taking her in to get checked a couple times. Um, and we've all been kind of sick, and I've, I'm struggling with... Uh, Right now, a swollen tonsil and some pretty severe tonsil stones, which I've never had to deal with before, and I'm on antibiotics for that. So just prayers for that, for healing, and just a, a praise. Again, like, like Lulu said, uh, it was Keegan's birthday on the, on the 5th, or it was yesterday. And Amani's birthday will be coming up on the 9th this coming week. So we're thankful for both of them, and um, they're, they're both growing and doing well, and they're overall healthy. We're just thankful for them. And, for happiness and health, and we're just a praise request for that. Thank you. Amen. And Tammy. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath. I have much to praise the Lord about in several prayer requests, but the few that come to mind. Um, our grandson, Dean, has been um, sick this week and recovering from a serious ear infection, so pray for his complete healing there. And um, our nephew, Jake, um, I've mentioned to him, to you before here, um, five weeks now into his program and found out this week he's been suffering a lot of pain, come to find out he needs to have hernia surgery. Mm -hmm. So pray for that for Jake too and his continued progress and success because I know we have an enemy that is really making it tough for him. And just we know Jesus is victorious and that he will succeed in this program and that he'll experience God's hand of healing and see God's work in his life. And also, um, I wanna praise God. Our future daughter-in-law found out this week she's gonna be out of a job a week mm -hmm. before the wedding in May. <laughs> um, but she's in the Fairview healthcare system and she had a job interview yesterday already. So awesome. she'll find out next week if she gets a new position. Amen. And also for my dear friend, Rochelle, who's in a very serious situation, predicament. Um, I just pray for God's leading in her life. Thank you. I just had one of my uh, one of my clients today that's going through a uh, his dad ended up passing away, and uh, he's going through a, a program to get away from alcohol, and so we'll share the story of David and Goliath with, with him and his wife and uh, bring a new perspective on victory, because sometimes the enemy will speak lies into your heart, you know. So, yeah. Good morning, church family. Uh, thanking God for a great week and strength. And um, my prayer request this uh, morning is I remember <clears throat> praying a lot about my neighbor who's still looking for a job. Um, she's been trying to look for a job since the last time I said the prayer. But now she got an interview, first interview. Um, just I told her I'll pray for her, and I just want you guys to join me in prayer. Um, 
at my work, I meet different people with different beliefs, and um, my heart goes out to people who have been raised in the church, and then now they're completely on the other side, 180 degrees, and it just breaks my heart. Um, and my prayer is that um, my my connection with them would speak the truth in love and have that connection, or if a God would present me with um, opportunities to make that right <laughs> for them. Um, I'm talking about kids who've been raised by missionaries, children who've been raised by missionaries who've left the church and have a different lifestyle. Um, prayer also um, for mothers, mothers who are raising children alone, mothers who are raising children, basically, it's a challenge, and just pray for our kids and, and the mothers who are raising them, including the dads. Amen. Anyone else? Ezra? One other uh, prayer request. I don't know if anyone here knows the Omai family, but we found out that on Thursday, the, the patriarch of the family, uh, Hezekiah, passed away. So keep them in your prayers if you know them or if you don't know them. All right, as far as possible, let's uh, bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this uh, Sabbath day that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we can come before you in your presence and uh, share uh, with each other and in your presence. I ask, Lord, that you would answer each of the prayer requests uh, that, we, that you heard us uh, today. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, answer them each according to your will. Uh, Lord, we know that we all have uh, private prayer requests that we may not always uh, verbalize. I ask, Lord, that you would be with each one of those and uh, fulfill them uh, in your will and your plan. We want to say a special prayer, Lord, for uh, Ezra and his uh, family. He's asking for uh, good health, and sometimes during this season, sickness can can uh, just be going around, and it can seem like it keeps hitting you and hitting you, and I ask, Lord, that uh, you would give them good strength and uh, good immunity and to be able to be strong uh, and uh, get good rest and different things that affect us, Lord. I ask that uh, you would uh, just make... make Make them strong to be able to resist and be able to have a good immunity against these, uh, these colds that are going around. We also want to thank you, Lord, for their birthdays, for their children. Uh, you know that uh, you see each child and that you, are, uh, yet you love them. And the Bible tells us, Lord, you tell us not to uh, forbid them to come to you. So I ask, Lord, that you would uh, continue to draw them uh, through us and through their parents and continue to put their, put their love in their hearts for you. We want to ask, Lord, for prayer for uh, the family's dad that passed away. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, be with them uh, as well. We want to ask, Lord, that you would be with, with uh, Dean that has an ear infection. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, work with the doctors and help him to be healed according to your will and give all the honor and glory to you. We also want to pray, Lord, that you give uh, Jake strength during his program that he's at. Um, I ask, Lord, that you would help him to uh, find his strength in you. There's so many different programs out there that look for strength around us. Uh, but, Lord, I ask that help us to first find our strength in you and then uh, for those around us to give us that support. We want to ask, Lord, that his surgery goes well as well. And we want to ask, Lord, that the future uh, sister-in-law, her job would go well as well. We ask, Lord, that you would guide Michelle She's making some uh, decisions, Lord, and she needs your guidance. I ask that you would be with her and lead her and guide her and help her to know and have that confidence uh, that you are, are her guide. 
We want to ask, Lord, that you will be with, uh, take us as neighbor who is looking for a job that is uh, having a first interview. I ask, Lord, that you would be uh, with the interviewer and then also with her neighbor as well to know that the job is a good fit or not and to be able to provide uh, that encouragement. We want to ask, Lord, that uh, take us as prayer requests, one, that, your, that her life would be a witness. And I think, Lord, that we can all uh, reflect on that, that we want our lives to be witnesses for you. I ask, Lord, that uh, her witness at her work, that she would be able to uh, continue to be the light that you have called each one of us to be. She's asking for prayer, Lord, for the single mothers uh, especially. Being a mother in and of itself in a married home is, is not the easiest, but being alone makes it more, more difficult. I ask, Lord, that uh, your people would join together and fill the places that are left void by the men that are not uh, involved. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, continue to guide each parent uh, that is a single parent as well and uh, give them the strength uh, to move forward and reconcile or reconcile as possible. And when it's not, I ask, Lord, that that strength would be found in you. We want to ask, Lord, that you bless uh, Elder David as he is uh, going to share your word. You've spoken a, a word to his heart. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand uh, the message that you are providing and give us all your Holy Spirit so that we can uh, apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer, O oh Lord, incline thine ear. Loose offering today is for the uh, local church budget. For uh, giving, you can uh, give in the offering box in the back of the church to the right. There's tithe envelopes back there as long as pens. We got new pens, by the way. So feel free and take and share them as you're, as you, uh, they have our church name on there and they have our church website. So they're actually good pens as well. So people actually like them. Okay, I'm serious. <laughs> okay. So. Local church budget is our offertory for today, and there's a little uh, testimony here. So it says, years ago, a mentor of mine encouraged me to take my relationship with God more as seriously as I take my career. She saw me as a very driven person, but she instructed me to make sure that I connected with God at the beginning of every day. That began my habit of waking up before sunrise around 5 a.m. to spend quiet time reading God's word and reflecting on it through prayer. A little bit ago, my husband and I noticed our daughter taking out her Bible in the morning before getting ready for school. She found a corner in our living room to pray. When my husband asked her why she was up so early, she said, Mommy gets up early to speak to Jesus, and I want to be like Mommy. I was so struck by, by my daughter, it was, I was so struck by my daughter, and it was and is my desire that my daughter develop a deep and personal connection with Jesus. I simply wasn't aware of just how much my silent witness, is, such as waking up in the morning, impressed her. Whether this is your first time at church or your family has built this church, if you look around, it's likely to see that you will see someone who has a spiritual journey uh, with God that you can learn from. Today's offering goes to our local church budget in order to keep our church ministries functioning, we depend on the generosity of our members returning a faithful offering to support our local church. And that was by Heather Thompson Day. So, yeah. So that was a pretty interesting that, our again, our lives are our biggest testimony. And uh, that little girl saw her mommy doing it, and she's like, I want to be like mommy. And so that's, that's uh, your kids look at you as well, and both parents have a huge influence on the children. Let's have a short prayer for our offering. 
Father in heaven, I ask, Lord, that you would uh, continue to put on our hearts to give according to our, our offering for today for church budget, church budget. I ask that you would continue to lead and guide us and uh, guide this church as we uh, continue to be the light uh, in the neighborhood uh, that we serve. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have children's story, which is going to be by Whitney. And uh, children, feel welcome to come forward, collect your little... Uh, baskets and then by the way this is the first sabbath of the month so the money that you give today for the children's offering actually goes to support our local children that are here at this church to go to our local adventist schools so we want to support adventist education so you can feel free and give as much as you like or put it in your tithe envelope thank you Okay. Good morning, children. I think it's a beautiful day outside. I think we can we can do a better good morning than that. Good morning, children. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Has anyone ever seen a mustard seed? Good question. Anyone who's seen a mustard seed? A mustard seed. Not the mustard that you put on your burger or no, not that. A mustard seed. Yeah, so a mustard seed, I'm going to be showing this around. Like, can you see that? It's like really small. That's the, that's the tip of your finger. So if you were to put it on the tip of your finger, it would be this small. Isn't that so small? If I drop that mustard seed over, on the floor, do you guys think you'd be able to find it? No, I don't think I don't think so. But funny thing, when that mustard seed grows, it becomes a tree that could be up to ten feet tall. Do you guys know how it's huge? Exactly. It can be up to ten feet tall. 
Anyone? Can you jump to 10 feet tall? Who can jump to 10 feet tall? Yeah, not me either. But mustard seeds are so cool that it's just a small seed that becomes a very, very, very big plant. An interesting thing is that God or Jesus was comparing a mustard seed to the kingdom of God. Can you think about that for a second? How is a mustard seed like the kingdom of God? Just think about it. You don't have to tell me. Just think about it. Think about it. Okay, I can take suggestions. How is a mustard seed like the kingdom of God? Exactly. Ah, Lulu, did you read my story? Did you sneak in and read my story? But that's exactly what Jesus was saying. He said, how can I describe the kingdom of God to my people? What is it like? And he said, it's like a mustard seed, that small seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of seeds, but it becomes the largest of plants. And it grows long branches that even birds can sit on and rest and take off from. So that's a very, very big tree. And how is that like the kingdom of God, you might ask? Well, when you think about when Jesus started. When Jesus started, did he have any followers? No, he just started by himself. And then he was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he picked up two brothers. Who knows who those two brothers are, were? Close. Actually, you're right. Simon Peter and? Who was Peter's brother? And? Andrew, exactly. So he, he found Simon Peter and Andrew along the shore and told them, come and follow me. And then he kept walking a little bit more. And then he came up to two other brothers. Who remembers the two other brothers who are disciples of Jesus? Starts with a J, both, both names. James and? Exactly. And slowly by slowly, as Jesus was going through his ministry, he gathered more disciples and he eventually had how many total disciples? Twelve. And then after that, when he was um, leaving earth to go and join his father back in heaven, he told those disciples, go bring other followers. And those disciples went to other people and and Christianity just kept on growing and growing. And now we have Christians all over the world. Any country that you can think of, there is one or two Christians. And is that, isn't that so beautiful? It is. Yes. Yes, yeah. And the thing is that the church just keeps on growing and growing and growing. And I have another illustration for you. Let's say I took an apple, right? I cut it open. I cut it in half. And then I have five seeds. If I took each of those seeds and planted them into the ground, each seed will produce an apple tree. Exactly. And how many apples do you think will be on that ap one apple tree? Fifty? A hundred? More? More? Yeah, actually, apples produce, one apple tree can produce between 150 to 300 apples. Now, remember, I had five seeds. If one seed planted one tree, I know it sounds like a lot of math, that has a lot of apples, how many, how many apples would we have with five trees? So many, right? And that's like the kingdom of God. Probably, we could even feed the whole world, right, with apples. And that's the thing about the kingdom of God. It just started with one person, and it is continuing to grow and grow. And I want to challenge you kids. Tell people about Jesus. Tell them about Jesus, because when you tell someone about Jesus, they can go tell another person about Jesus. They can go tell another person. And now think about it. What if we all told people about Jesus? Wouldn't there be a lot of more followers of Jesus? And don't we want a lot of people to join our church? How many of us want people to join our church? And how many of us want to tell people about Jesus? Everybody's hands in the church should be up. 
Even not just the kids, exactly. We should be excited about the good news and tell people about Jesus. So my challenge for you this week is tell at least one person about Jesus. Tell them Jesus loves them, Jesus died for them, and Jesus forgives them. And welcome them, invite them to your church, to our church, so that they could also be part of uh, followers of Jesus, okay? How many of you guys will be telling someone about Jesus? Hands up. Yes, yes. And just like the one mustard seed that was planted that continued to grow to a big plant, even us, we can continue to just plant small seeds in people's hearts by telling them about Jesus. I hope this story blesses you kids, and I hope you continue to tell people about Jesus. Could I have someone to pray for us? Oh, so many volunteers. Okay, I'll take this three to pray, and we can start over okay. here. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what is the and Jesus, and you love us, and Jesus died for us, and, and you have us us in. Amen. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you that we're at church. Thank you that we had a great day at church. And, and while we're just going to listen, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for some new kids that came today at church. Please help more kids to come and join and more parents and more people so that we can grow our church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you so much, kids. Today, the scripture reading comes from the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25. Jude, verses 24 and 25. And it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you, present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Morning and happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. It's good to be with you again today, be able to share. Um, toward the end of the week, I started getting a cold, and so I was like, hmm, am I going to be able to speak this Sabbath? But praise the Lord, uh, it's mostly better. I know I might sound a little bit off, so I apologize for that. But I know the Lord has a blessing for us this morning. I want to share with you a, a, a story or a, a tools, I would say, about how to gain victory in our lives, with our, in our walk with Jesus. And I've shared this before, but I want to, to share it again because I know how much of a blessing it is to me and I know it's a blessing to others as well. How many of you know what Pilgrim's Progress is? Okay, I see about three or four or five hands, okay. Maybe six, not too many. Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory that was written a long time ago. And I apologize, I should know the date, and I don't. Um, but it was a long time ago. It was in, I think, uh, the 16, 1600s to 1700s, somewhere in that range. Um, John Bunyan was a uh, not such a good man. He was a really rough character. He was a soldier in the army. He did a lot of things that were not nice. And yet the Lord got a hold of him, and he was converted. And he started preaching and teaching about Jesus. And the authorities weren't so happy about that. 
Because why? Well, he didn't have training as a preacher. He wasn't part of the official Church of England. He didn't have the credentials from the authorities to be able to preach. And back then, if you didn't have the right uh, education, background, and credentials to, to speak, you couldn't speak, you couldn't share Jesus, at least not in a public setting. And so he was told to stop preaching, and he didn't obey. He kept preaching, and he was told to stop again, and he kept preaching. And eventually, he got put in prison for refusing to obey and still telling people about Jesus. Now, when, when, our, when the authorities on earth tell us to obey, as long as they're not telling us to do something that's against the Word of God, we can obey them, right? But when the authorities tell us to not share Jesus, that's not something we can obey. We have to be willing to step up and share anyways. So Bunyan, while the blessing in this is while John Bunyan was in prison, he wrote a story or an allegory. How many of you know what an allegory is? Okay, well, three hands, four hands. <laughs> okay, an allegory is a story that teaches a lesson. It's not meant to be taken exactly literally like this story happened, and yet it's not fiction. Fiction is a made-up, make-believe story, but it's supposed to look like a real story, right? Uh, that actually happened. And maybe some English majors could tell me a better definition than what I'm giving you. An allegory is a story that tells a lesson, that teaches lessons throughout its story, and, you ha and, it, and there's things in the story that kind of help you realize this is not completely real, but it teaches a lesson. I know it, it sounds like, okay, what's the difference, right? Um, I'll let the English majors get into that with you <laughs> a little more. So growing up, Pilgrim's Progress was one of my favorite audio adventures. My brother and I would spend hours listening and re-listening to the experiences of Christian Hopeful, faithful, ignorance, worldly wise man, Christiana and her four boys, Great Heart, their guide, and many other characters uh, like uh, the interpreter and others throughout P Pilgrim's Progress that had lessons to teach and that you learned by their, their uh, experience of going along the Christian walk. Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory of a, of a Christian man who gives his life to Jesus and his journey to to the celestial city, his journey through his life. Of course, as a, as, a, as a young kid, my favorite parts, of course, were the battles against the dragon Apollyon, against the giant Despair, against the giant Slaygood and the giant Grimm and other battles, right? We liked the battles as a kid, right? Or at least as a boy, I don't know. I really liked the battles. I think girls like them too. <laughs> they were exciting. They were uh, nerve-wracking. Are they going to win? And so I really enjoyed those as a kid. And some of the parts as a boy that I didn't care about so much were the long conversations they would have sometimes in between, back and forth, talking about the Christian walk and how to be closer to Jesus and how to understand the different uh, lessons in the Bible. But guess what? As I got older in my teenage years and as a young adult, these portions became much more precious to me. And one section I want to share with you this morning as I open uh, my, our talk for today <clears throat> happened at the, Pilgrim's prog at the Pilgrim's guest house named Beautiful. Christian, who is the main character in the story, had just arrived and was meeting with Watchful, the porter, and his daughters, Prudence, Piety, and Charity. And as they were waiting for supper, they talked with Christian about his journey, about the difficulties he had met with in the way, and the lessons he had learned along his journey toward the celestial city. Toward the end of their conversation, Prudence asks, do you find at certain times that you have victory over temptations when at other times those temptations completely uh, take you over or vanquish you? Christian replied, oh yes, I do wish my victories could be more consistent. And can you, any of you relate to that? Any of you wish sometimes your victories in Jesus could be more consistent? Sometimes you lose your patience more than you wish, or you, you don't always use your time the way you'd like to wish, like you'd wish to use it. Prudence replied, when thou, when thou art victorious over said temptation, can you remember by what means you find yourself the victor? Well, let me consider, Christian said. For one thing, it always happens when I think of what I saw on the cross. 
When I behold him hanging there and see what I, that when I do sin, I add yet another stripe to his back. Why at such times carnal desire hath no power over me. When else, replied Prudence, when I behold this fine broidered coat woven in the loom of heaven, I see that when I surrender to my carnal thoughts, my coat becomes to become, begins to become stained and worn. But when I think that this coat is the proof of my salvation and given by him who died for me, why, I get the victory, and it shines forth again all bright and shiny new. When else, asked Prudence. Christian replied, also, when I look into the scroll or the roll I carry in my, in my bosom, that, I will, that, that will do it too. And when my thoughts wax warm about the place I'm going, that will also do it. Then you have found the keys to consistent victory, have you not? Replied Prudence. Verily, it doth seem I have, replied Christian. If I would but choose to think continually on these things, then sin would have no power over me. I could ever walk in the sunshine of victory. Twas thus, Prudence replied, "'Twas thus that our Lord and Master did get his victory over the world and over the flesh and over the devil. Then may I do the same? Can it be so? Christian exclaimed. Thou mayest, if thou wilt do those, these things and yet two more. Being what? Christian asked. You must, at the first approach of evil, turn instantly from beholding it and cry unto thy Lord for help. Christian replied, I can do that. What else? When the world or the flesh or the devil yet seem to tempt you, you must cast in their face the words of Scripture. What does this do? asked Christian. Prudence replied, The word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, doth cut and hack so terribly sore that they must soon retire from the conflict. Christian exclaimed, Why, herein is a marvelous thing. Prudence continued, "'Tis because the word of God is creative and alive. And when we believe that the word of God can do what it says it can do, and when we depend on that word only to do what it says it will do, then is all the power of heaven at our command. Christian exclaimed, "'Then by keeping my thoughts on heavenly things, and by being instant in prayer, and by quickly drawing the word of God, I may be as a warrior that never loses a battle.'" Prudence replied, Thou dost begin to understand. Now, is the only, now there is only the application of what we have learned. So we want to look at those. I, I pulled out a few keys here from this story that I wanted to expound on with some, some verses in the Bible. And we see that John Bunyan didn't come up with this himself. He found this in the Word and put this into the story. So keys to consistent victory in Jesus. Key number one, there's going to be seven of them, so you might want to write these down. Seven keys to consistent victory. There may be others, but these are the keys that I pulled out of this, for, this, for this talk here. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Turn there with me. Philippians chapter 8, sorry, Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. It says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them all but dung, that I may win Christ. In verse 9, and, I will, and to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of, and of Christ, the righteousness which is of faith in, by God. So what kind of righteousness do we want to be covering us? Our own righteousness? We want to be covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness. You remember in the story when he talks about that fine broidered coat that he was wearing? That was the, symbolized the righteousness of Christ that he had received when he had beheld the cross and his burden and the guilt and the sins had rolled from off his back. His rags were still there. They took the rags away and clothed him in the righteousness of Christ at the cross. So remember, 
one key to the consistent victory is asking the Lord every day to receive that robe of Christ's righteousness. If we go to Ephesians, it, it talks a little bit more about how this works. Let's go to Ephesians, just back a book. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through chapter 5 and verse 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, starting at verse 22. Give you a moment to get there. The Bible reads that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and holiness. You see the symbolism here again of putting on Christ, putting on the new man. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor, for we are all members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor and work with his, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, but whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a sweet-smelling savor. Once again, we see this symbolism of taking off the old man and putting on the new man, that robe of righteousness in Christ. And we notice that it's not just a robe that sits there. Is there actions in these verses that demonstrate that that robe of righteousness works out in our life new life? new actions, new choices, good choices, right? So for key number one, we want to put on the robe of Christ, Christ's righteousness and remember that that covers us. And if we are looking at ourselves and looking at that garment, instead of looking to Jesus, we might find, man, we're, we stumble, we fall. But if we look to Jesus, that, that robe can stay, can stay clean. What if we get a stain on, on your garment? Well, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What can wash away the sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So key number one, make sure we're putting on the robe of Christ's righteousness. Okay, number two, stay in the word. Satan knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invents every possible device to engross the mind. Satan knows our strength is in the word. Our strength is found in the word, and therefore he has invented all kinds of distractions. I think we're living in an age where there's more distractions than ever before, right? I mean, I don't even have to list them, do I? You know what they are. And they were different for each person. Some distractions appeal to some. Other distractions appeal to other people. But all of it is a distraction and keeping us away from the word. And it doesn't even have to be something bad. It could even just be being too busy and doing good things to spend time in the word. The word of God has encouragement, promises, warnings, and stories Stories that show how God led in the lives of ordinary people that, were calling, that he called and were willing to surrender all, and many that were not willing. We get to see both in the stories of, in the Word of God. The Word is the standard of right and wrong, and through the Word we learn wisdom. The more we immerse ourselves 
in the word, the easier we will be able to understand right from wrong and have wisdom for the challenging choices and experiences we face in this life. So key number two, spend quality time in the word. And the psalmist David talks about this in Psalm 119. He says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to your word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. David knew this was a key to victory in his life. So spending time in the word. What was, what was key number one? <clears throat> Put on Christ's righteousness. Number two, spend time in what? In the word. Okay, number three, spend time in prayer. Prayer is the breath of the soul, and as we pray and plead with God for all the things, for all things, our hearts are changed. When we're tempted to complain, pray. When we're tempted to talk about the failings of others, what should we do? Pray. When we're tempted to criticize those in leadership, whether that's in, in the home, in the church, in the school, or in government, what should we do? Pray. The strength acquired in prayer to God will prepare us for our daily duties. The temptations with which we are daily exposed make prayer a necessity. In order that we may be kept by the power of God through faith, the desires of the mind should be continually ascending in silent prayer to God. When we are surrounded by influences that are calculated to lead us away from God, our petitions for help and strength must be unwearied. Unless this is so, we shall never be successful in breaking down pride and overcoming the power of temptation to sinful indulgences, which keep us from Jesus. The light of truth, sanctifying the life, will discover to the receiver the sinful passions of his heart, which are striving for the mastery, and which make it necessary for him to stretch every nerve and exert all his powers to resist Satan that he may conquer through the merits of Christ. This is not so he may conquer through his own strength. That's a losing battle every time, but that we may conquer through the strength that Jesus will give us, through the merits of Christ. Spend time in prayer. Number one, put on the grove of Christ's righteousness. Number two, number three, spend time in prayer. Okay, number four, think of the place we are going to, heaven. We all look forward to great events in our life, right? We look forward to Christmas, right? Presents and family and time together. We look forward to vacation, right? Especially if we get to go to some warm place when it's cold, right? In, in Minnesota winters. We look forward to time with our friends and family. And most of us look forward to a paycheck, right? How much do we look forward to heaven? Do we even desire it? Or are we comfortable here? Am I so happy and content here that I don't even spend time contemplating the wonders and joys that we will be able to experience in heaven? 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, But it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for, for those who love him. We should contemplate the better land, where tears are never shed, where temptations and trials are never experienced where losses and reproaches are never known, and where peace and joy and happiness is always there. Here your imagination may run full scope. These thoughts will make you more heavenly-minded, will endue you with heavenly vigor, and will satisfy your, thirst, your thirsty soul for rivers of living waters, and will set, up your heart, will, will set upon your heart the seal of the divine image. They will fill, your, fill you with joy and hope and believing and will abide with you as a com as a for sorry I'm really reading terrible this morning. <laughs> they will fill you with joy and hope and believing, and will abide with you as a comforter forever. So let us spend time thinking about heaven, thinking about the joys and the peace and the the questions we might want to ask the characters in the Bible. What do I want to ask Moses or Joseph or Daniel or Hosea or? Some of the other characters that we study so much, right? What do I want to ask Jesus when I first get there? What do I want to ask my guardian angel? What, is it, what stories are they going to be able to tell us about the times that, he, that they saved us from things that we didn't even know about? 
what kind of house do I want to build in the new earth? It says in the Bible we're going to build houses and plant vineyards. I, I don't know how we're going to do that. I don't know if it's going to be masonry or carpentry or if it's going to be something completely different that I don't even know about. But it's, it's cool to think about and to contemplate what heaven's going to be like. Heaven's not just sitting on a cloud playing a harp and doing nothing else. Heaven's a lot more than that, amen? There's a lot more to heaven than that. And all surrounded by people who are completely unselfish and heavenly beings that we can learn from and, and converse with. So, what was number one? Okay, and number two? Stay in the word. Number three? Spend time in prayer. Number four? Think of heaven, yes. And number five, at the first approach of evil, what do we do? We turn instantly from beholding it, and who do we cry to? We cry, cry to Jesus for help. Help me. So many of us don't do that, right? The first approach of evil, what do we do? Hmm, that looks good. I want to go there. Isn't that usually our response? May God give us a different response. If we're walking with Jesus... We have that time, that moment to say, no, Lord, help me. Change my desires. Give me that strength to turn away from evil instead of saying, oh, I'm, that looks good, and let's contemplate the evil. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us, no temptation has overtaken you except which such as is common to man. But God is faithful, amen, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Sin is deceptive. It has a bewitching, hypnotic effect. The longer you look at it, the more you want it. The more in your mind you may know that sin is dangerous and it's going to not lead to any good thing, but by allowing it or keeping it in front of us, we become attracted to it, and we finally come to the point where we think maybe there's something worth having uh, down that path that we know isn't best for us when in reality the wages of sin is death. We have a work to do in resisting temptation. Those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, and hearing that which would suggest impure thoughts. That's difficult to do in this world, amen? The mind should not be left to wander random upon every subject that the adversary of souls may suggest. The devil wants to destroy us. He doesn't leave us alone. Girding up the loins of your mind, says the Apostle Paul, be sober, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in your ignorance, but like as he which call you is holy, be yourselves also holy in all manner of living. It's 1 Peter 3, 13 and 15. It says Paul, whatsoever things are true, we're told what to think of, we're told what not to think about, right? And then Paul tells us what should we be thinking about? Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. We must be aided by the abiding influence of the Holy Spirit, which will attract the mind upward to dwell upon pure and holy things. This isn't natural for us, right? It's not natural for our minds to, to travel in things that are true and honest and a good report. But the Holy Spirit can pull our minds that direction. Amen? The first is put on the grove of Christ's righteousness. Second, stay in the word. The, sec the third, the fourth, and the fifth. The first approach of evil, cry for help and turn instantly from beholding it. Amen. Number six. When tempted, what did Jesus do? It is written. He used the scriptures to combat that temptation. Amen. So when tempted, use the words of scripture like Jesus did. So let's turn to Matthew chapter four. 
Turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Here we have the temptation of Jesus. He's been hungry for 40 days and 40 nights fasting. He's in the wilderness. And the devil comes to tempt him, right? And what is his response? Let's look in verse 4. What, is, what does he say? But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What about verse 7? Jesus said unto him, It is written, again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then verse 10. We find a pattern here, right? Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus met Satan with the words of Scripture. If anybody was qualified to argue with the devil, right, it would have been, it would have been Jesus. If anybody had the smarts to be able to outwit him with rhetoric or philosophy or arguments, logic, Jesus would have been the one to do that, right? But that's not what Jesus did. What did he do? He used Scripture. He said, it is written... In every temptation, the weapon of his warfare was the word of God. Satan wanted a miracle, but with a great, what, what which is greater than all the miracles is a firm reliance, reliance on a thus saith the Lord was a sign that could not be controverted. So long as Christ held this position, the tempter could gain no advantage. And it's the same with us. If we hold on to the thus saith the Lord from the scripture. It's a position that cannot be assailed by the tempter. And unto us are given exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, exceeding, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's in 2 Peter 1.4. Every promise of God, sorry, every promise in God's word is ours. By the word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, we are to live. When assailed by temptation, look not to circumstances or to the weakness of self, but to the power of the word. All strength, all its strength is yours. By the word of the, thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. David understood this also. The word of God has power, and it is alive. So, number one was... Robe of Christ's righteousness. What was number two? Stay in the word. Stay in the word. Number three? Pray. Pray. What was number four? Think of heaven. And number five? Cry for help and turn from evil. Number six? When tempted, use the word of Scripture to combat that temptation. And number seven? I think number seven is... I'm not sure any one is more important than the other. They're all important, right? But number seven, look to the cross. When tempted to sin, think of the cross, about the cross and what Jesus suffered that we might have life. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes, those hands so often reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars, those feet so tireless on ministries of love spiked to the tree. That royal head pierced by the crown of thorns, those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe, and all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face, speaks to you and to me, speaks to each child of humanity, declaring, it is for you that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. It is for you he spoils the domain of death and opens the floodgates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves and walked on the foam capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice, and this from love to thee. He, the sin bearer, endures the wrath of divine justice, and for your sake and mine, becomes sin itself. You know, the cross has a drawing effect. 
And I think sometimes we as Christians have heard it so much that it starts to lose that effect because we think, oh, yep, the cross. But we don't stop and think about what Jesus did for us, spend time contemplating it. By beholding, we become changed. We see at the cross what sin really is. We see that we have a God who loves us and who became sin for us, and he died that we might live. Something begins to change within us at the cross. Love begets love. As we see the love of God towards us as sinners, we don't want to sin because we know that if we do, we add yet another stripe to his back. And we love Jesus. We are we're broken by what he did for us. In light of the cross, all our sinfulness and selfishness is revealed. And we, don't, we cannot stay there opening ourselves to the love of God and be lifted up with pride. It just doesn't work. So look to the cross. As we look at the cross of Christ, as we see what Jesus did for us, this has a huge power of breaking sin and temptation in our life. Amen? Let's review one more time. Our keys. Remember to contemplate and put on the robe of what? Christ's righteousness. Stay in the? Word. Spend time in? Prayer. Think of where? Amen. When we were assailed by temptation, do what? Turn and cry. When tempted, what? use scripture as Jesus did. Look to and contemplate what? By keeping our minds on heavenly things, by being instant in prayer, and by drawing the sword of Scripture, we may be as warriors that never lose a battle in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. The promise in Jude 24 and 25 isn't just a nice-sounding phrase. It's reality. God's Word has the power to create that real in our life today. As we close, I think of a, sm a small boy who had just heard, heard the story of blind Bartimaeus. If you were blind, what would you ask Jesus for? His older friend asked the little fellow. His answer was immediate. I'd ask Jesus for a dog and a chain to lead me. Ask Jesus for a dog and chain to lead me? How many of us are like that? Jesus offers us victory through him in our Christian living and lays out the keys in his word, but we're satisfied with being led along by maybe a lesser option. Jesus wants us to have victory in him, amen? May we pray for the Holy Spirit to bring these lessons to mind as we do our daily walk day by day. These lessons have been a blessing to me since I was a little boy growing up listening to this over and over again, and I pray that they were a blessing to you today. Jesus wants to give us victory. We serve a God that isn't interested just in forgiving our past sins, just, isn't just in giving us life, <clears throat> but is interested in giving us victory, amen? amen? And it's not victory so we can lift ourselves up and say, oh, look at me. No, it's victory so we can have life, even here on earth, and have life more abundantly, and be ready when Jesus comes. Amen? Jesus' way is the best way. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity we've had to look at the keys that you have in your word. And there are more, Father, but these seven keys, I think, are powerful as we apply them to our lives, Father. May we remember them when we're tempted. May we remember them when we need to be drawn back to you. And may they be a power for good in our lives today. Father, we ask especially for the Holy Spirit. Father, for without your Spirit, all of this would be meaningless and without power. And Father, we need that power. Amen? So today, we ask for the Holy Spirit to strengthen us in our walk with you, and that we may fall more and more in love with Jesus, moment by moment, day by day. Thank you for your promise to answer this prayer and give us these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing song this morning.
is hymn number 602, O Brother, Be Faithful, 602. I invite our chorister to lead us in that. Father, we ask that you would dismiss us now with your presence and your blessing, that as we go home, that we would have your spirit going with us, and that throughout this new week, we would be sharing Jesus with everyone we can, that they too may find the joy and the peace and the victory that you have for them in Jesus. Amen. <laughs>